attorney general's stance on how to reopen schools in the state, what that means to thousands of Texas students this fall. She may not be on the ballot in November, but the Bear County Republican chair says she's not going along with election results. The claims she makes against the county, including the elections administrator. And I'm closely watching the activity in the Gulf of Mexico as that tropical system has the potential to bring us some decent moisture this weekend. I'll have a full update coming right up. There is more reason to check your hand sanitizer. The FDA's list of ones to avoid is growing. We'll explain why coming up. And what new research is saying about people who suffered from COVID-19 and their immunity to the virus. The News at 5 starts right now. First at five, last week's election results not certified yet amid allegations that it was a compromised election. That claim coming from the Bear County Republican chair who lost her seat in a bruising race last Tuesday. Cynthia Brem is claiming in a lengthy letter that there were issues and a conflict of interest, so she will not certify the votes. Among the grievances, Brem claims the county failed to produce signed an official chain of custody for early vote data for 31 voting centers, that the county refused to post a guard to secure early voting data as required by the Texas Election Code, and that early voting data was accessed the weekend before the actual count began. Brim also cites a conflict of interest saying Jackie Callanan serves two key positions as elections administrator as well as judge at the central counting station. She also accuses Callanan of attempting to limit or restrict the number of poll watchers at that location using COVID-19 as reasoning. Brem says for these reasons and an investigation into the March 3rd election that is still underway, she cannot certify the runoff results. So is this all sour grapes? Brem's refusal to certify the votes is unlikely to succeed since the state GOP chair can take over any duty that Brem has not performed as county chair. We've reached out to the elections office and to Brem's opponent and have not yet received a reaction to her claim. By the way, Brem lost her bid for re-election by a landslide of about 13,000 votes. Local and state leaders have issued guidelines on what districts can and should do to get kids back to school. But Attorney General Ken Paxton is now challenging those mandates that apply to religious schools, even saying that they do not have to abide by the rules at all. Devin Clark explains why some who practice state law disagree. I don't think it's a blanket rule either way. When it comes to allowing religious schools to choose whether to abide by state mandated restrictions on in-person classes amid the pandemic, attorney Matthew Manning says there are loopholes. Even in the law that is cited by Mr. Paxton, the Religious Freedom Act, there is a note that says um, governments can impose restrictions as long as they're the least restrictive um, you know, imposition. The opinion comes after State Attorney General Ken Paxton authored a letter which in part said, quote, when the governor issued orders applicable to public schools, he expressly acknowledged that private schools and institutions have the freedom to make their own decisions, end quote. Manning says extenuating circumstances affect that clause. I will say that governments do have the ability to put some imposition on religious practice where it is a compelling state interest. And that's clearly what you have here. However, Paxton says imposing the mandates on private religious schools would violate the U.S. and Texas constitutions and the Texas Religious Freedom Restoration Act. But Manning says there are other factors to consider. There are students who attend religious, you know, uh, religious schools that don't actually adhere to that religion, right? And in that respect, the question becomes how do you reconcile their interest in not being in a situation where they could potentially be exposed unreasonably to this virus with the institution's um, interest in being able to potentially have some kind of religious exercise. Manning adds that because of the unprecedented nature of the pandemic, only time can tell the likelihood of litigations that may arise out of these types of blanket mandated decisions. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Some San Antonio schools are choosing to move forward with on-campus learning as early as August 17th, including Cornerstone Christian Schools and St. Matthew's Catholic School. Cash, drugs, and a stolen car. We're getting a look at the three people arrested last night in a gambling bust on the south side. The operation allegedly going on at a home on East Mayfield and Boswell. 
That's where 24-year-old Marcus Marcos Martinez, 30-year-old Jonathan Ramirez, and 32-year-old Annalisa Garza Pena were all taken into custody. The sheriff's office tipped off last night by a concerned neighbor. About 10 clients were inside at the time of the bust. Investigators seized $4,400 in cash, motherboards from the machines, and a stolen car. And that's not the end of it. Our narcotics canine came to location and discovered a pretty large amount of, of uh, crystal methamphetamine. Martinez, who is believed to have been the one in charge at the time, faces a charge of gambling promotion. Ramirez and Garza Pena were arrested on unrelated warrants. More arrests and federal charges are expected in this one. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden focusing his campaign efforts online as opposed to rallies and in-person events. His campaign released a new video on social media today featuring a lengthy conversation between President Barack Obama and his former VP. Karen Kafa recaps the conversation and what Biden hopes to accomplish with all of this. Karen. Yeah, Steve, and just a short while ago, we saw another example of how this coronavirus era campaign continues to challenge these presidential candidates. President Trump announcing the cancellation of all Republican convention activities in Jacksonville. So both of these campaigns looking for ways to get their message out to voters. For Joe Biden, it was sitting down with an old friend. Former President Barack Obama. I know how deeply you care about American families. And presidential hopeful Joe Biden. To change the way in which we deal with allowing people an opportunity to make a living. Joining forces in a socially distanced sit down designed to capitalize on Biden's connection to his still popular former running mate. Topics in the nearly 16 minute long video ranged from the current COVID crisis. When we left office, you had set up a pandemic office within the White House. We knew pandemic diseases. This wasn't going to be the only one that ever occurred. To the growing cries for racial justice in America. It is a sign of leadership when you are willing to hear other people's experiences. The video also draws a sharp contrast between the former VP and President Donald Trump without mentioning him by name. I don't think he has any sense of empathy. Biden is ramping up his attacks on the man currently sitting in the Oval Office, calling him America's first racist president during a virtual town hall. President Trump defended his record on race. Prior to the China plague coming in, floating in, coming into our country and really uh, doing terrible things all over the world, doing terrible things. We had the best African-American, Hispanic-American, Asian-American. Almost every group was the best for unemployment. And with the announcement of the cancellation of convention activities in Jacksonville, President Trump appears to be letting go of that idea of giving a big acceptance speech for the Republican nomination. He said he told his staff it is just not the right time. As for what he might replace that with, he didn't really specify. He said they've got some time to figure it out. Steve? Hey, Karen, there are some tensions in the ongoing conversations about the next round of stimulus. So we're not just talking about tensions between Republicans and Democrats. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. This seems to be some back and forth within the Senate Republican caucus, in addition to going back and forth between Senate Republicans in the White House. Now, remember House Democrats said put their opening bid on the table when they passed that $3 trillion stimulus bill back in May. So it's really been about Senate Republicans trying to find something that is amenable, not only to getting something to the president's desk, passed through the Democratic majority House, but also something that the president would sign. Some of the tensions surround unemployment insurance. Remember, there were a number of Republicans who balked at the idea of that additional unemployment insurance, that extra $600 that went through July 31st. There are a number of Republicans in the Senate who are objecting to that idea. And then, of course, there was that idea of the payroll tax cut that President Trump uh, seemed to signal that he wouldn't sign a bill that did not have it. Now, of course, he's kind of uh, gone back and forth on that when it became very clear that the Democrats were not amenable to that and some within the Republican Party were not amenable to that. This morning, the Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said that is not something that will be included in this, but still a great deal of negotiation and a lot of pieces at play, Steve, getting House Democrats on board and the entire Senate Republican caucus and, of course, getting the president to sign it. Steve? Yeah, we'll see when or if this whole thing comes together. Karen Kafe live at the White House. Thank you, Karen.
Moving on to the latest on Michael Cohen's prison sentence. A federal judge allowing his release to home confinement beginning tomorrow. Cohen is serving a three-year sentence for directing hush money payments to women who had claimed that they had affairs with President Trump. He was released from jail back in May, but then was reincarcerated on July 9th after he would not sign an agreement that would have prevented him from publishing a tell-all book or engaging with media while on house arrest. His lawyers then filed a lawsuit against Attorney General William Barr, the head of the Bureau of Prisons, and the warden at the federal prison in Otisville, New York, claiming Cohen was sent back to jail in retaliation. And look at that vertical development on a few of the clouds. I stress a few, but we do have some growth and that has led to a few little showers out there. So let's take a look at the radar screen right now and really over the past couple of hours, just south of Highway 90 and even downtown, we had a few little downpours briefly pop up. Agriculturally insignificant, insignificant for your lawn and garden, but better than nothing, right? A little bit of hope, especially for what's coming down the pike, but also Edwards County again today, seeing those little downpours briefly pop up, clipping parts of Real County and along I-37 in Atascosa County as well. Some activity there. 90s to right around 100 at this hour. Weather watchers checking in 97 in Holotus, 95 in Bernie, and New Braunfels 99. Of course, the focus is on Tropical Depression 8, likely to become Tropical Storm Hannah, I think later on this evening. This is making a beeline for the Texas coast. We're going to talk about that, the primary impacts, and what it means for us in terms of rainfall coming right up. Can't wait. Thank you, Adam. Well, new at five, more reasons to check the hand sanitizer you're buying. The FDA has expanded its list of products that avoid saying they contain toxic wood alcohol. Four more brands have been recalled today. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with that, plus a warning if you bought an artificial Christmas tree last year. As demand for hand sanitizer surges, so do questionable imports, most made in Mexico. The FDA's list of ones to avoid is ballooning to now 75 varieties. The agency says it's seen a sharp increase in hand sanitizer products labeled to contain ethanol, but have tested positive for methanol, toxic if ingested or absorbed through the skin. Blindness, hospitalizations, and 10 deaths are believed linked to ingesting it. Four more companies have recalled their products Bloomin, the distributor for E Brands, is here in San Antonio. Also, Optimus, Bio AAA, and Bercy. Some of these were sold at big chain retailers, including Walmart and Costco. Before you buy an unknown brand, check that FDA's growing list. In other recalls, exploding cookware. 11,000 green pan simmer light Dutch ovens are recalled after reports of the lids exploding in the oven. Contact the company. Take a look, parents. 22,000 Manhattan toy activity balls are recalled because babies can choke on parts. They were sold at Target since last summer. Take them back. And if you bought an artificial Christmas tree last year at Home Depot, check this. 99,000 Home Accents trees are recalled after 500 reports of the foot pedal overheating. Contact Willis Electric. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. So, you recovered from COVID-19? You might now have the antibodies, but how long will they last? That new research has discovered what that new research has discovered when it comes to immunity next. After people are infected with the novel coronavirus, their natural immunity to the virus could actually decline sooner rather than later. That's according to new research. Antibodies are the proteins the body makes to fight infection. The CDC says their presence may tell you whether you've been infected with coronavirus in the past. But new research suggests antibody responses may start to decline within a month from the time the COVID-19 symptoms first emerged, says William Hasselbein, president of Access Health International. Now there are two studies, one from uh, the Spain and one from the UK, that actually measures the virus in people and the antibodies and watch the immunity decline. That's what we were afraid of. In one of the studies released on a medical server and not yet peer reviewed, the researchers say those who have a severe form of COVID-19 may have longer lasting antibodies than those with mild cases. But it's still only a matter of months before those antibodies wane. 
They say the study has important implications when considering protection against reinfection and the durability of vaccines. Other experts point out we don't know for sure whether people can get reinfected with coronavirus. If it were true that the antibodies and protection were only lasting 20 to 30 days, I think we would have start, started to see some significant amounts of reinfection. We haven't. The study suggests vaccines in development either need to generate stronger and longer lasting protections as compared to a natural infection or they need to be given regularly. All right, we are definitely in the summer in South Texas when we are saying a tropical depression looks really good right now. Right, I know. And you'll often hear me say on air when we're in drought situations that, hey, we could use a weak tropical system, weak tropical storm to move through. And it looks like that could just be exactly what we're going to be getting. But there still are some questions surrounding this system, of course. So let's talk about it all and give you our uh, best estimates of what to expect at this point. All right, across the state, Few folks getting lucky, especially up in the panhandle and parts of North Texas there. But the focus is on this activity that you see here in the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, you're not going to see any green or thunderstorm activity within the center of this because it's outside of radar range. But trust me, there are some thunderstorms flaring up in there. You look at the visible satellite imagery and we did this exactly 24 hours ago and already this is looking like a much more organized a tropical system. It's currently a tropical depression. I think by the night beat, this will likely be tropical storm Hannah. But you look at the low level clouds that counterclockwise circulation gotten a little bit tighter compared to yesterday. And then the upper level clouds blowing up and out the opposite way. And there's also still some good convection around that center of circulation there. So becoming a little better organized, nonetheless, still considered tropical depression eight winds of about 35 miles per hour gusting to 45. And even when it gets upgraded to a tropical storm, the impact is going to remain the same for the vast majority of Texas. And that's going to be rainfall potential. A little bit of wind at the coast, but rainfall potential. So here's the track. By 1 a.m. Saturday, maximum winds estimated to be around 60 miles per hour. Then we get into Saturday about 1 p.m. And it could be making landfall anywhere from about Matagorda Bay down to Port Mansfield. Thereafter, weakening as we get into Saturday night and Sunday. And the track has been jogged a little farther to the south uh, than previous forecast because that seems to be the general trend in terms of the models. And speaking of the models, we love to show you the spaghetti plots, and they're in pretty good agreement there. You see Matagorda all the way down to about Port Mansfield, and that's where we expect landfall of this tropical system to be. Primary impact will be rain and the potential for flooding rain. And it's impossible for us to tell you right now how much we're going to get in San Antonio, even um, honing in on what's our best estimate. Basically, there's the potential for a few inches of rain. I think that's the best way to put it. A few inches of rain is the best potential, but here's the key. Farther north you are of Highway 90, the lesser amounts you're going to get. The farther south you are, the higher amount of rain you're going to get. So farther south of Highway 90, you have much better odds of heavier rainfall. Now, right along the coastline, we could see some of those brief 60 mile per hour gusts, but that would be it around here. Just a little bit of a breeze and some off and on showers. We made it to 100 today. Right now we're at 99 and for the most part, we're in the 90s to right near 100 tomorrow. More of the same back up to the century mark, partly cloudy. A few isolated pop up showers, so 20% chance. Then we get into Saturday, we bump it up to a 60%, especially later in the day on Saturday. Uh, I was talking to a guy installing a fence earlier today, and he was happy that, oh, yeah, oh, Saturday morning you'll be all right. Yeah, you got Saturday morning to work outdoors. That's the way it's looking. And then Sunday, I may even be increasing those rain chances a little, little bit because I think most of our rain around here should be off and on, mainly late Saturday and into Sunday. But either way, some cooler readings, closer to 90. 89 degrees. Nice. Thank cool. you. Yeah, even 90. We'll take it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So the Spurs opened their scrimmages today and it was a youth movement. Well, and they get an early test against the best team yeah. in the NBA, even though it is a scrimmage. When we come back, you're right. It was a youth movement today. Guys like Lonnie Walker, the fourth shining in this particular event. And also, when we come back, it's business as usual for some teams in high school football and volleyball coming up.
Spurs are back in action. Their first preseason game, if you will, against the league's best of the Milwaukee Bucks in the NBA restart. Brooke Lopez with a hot hand for the three. Bucks take a six-point lead in the first quarter. Spurs trail, but just by two. A minute to go in the first quarter. Giannis Antetokounmpo slices his way in, splits the Spurs D right to the hoop. Second quarter, Spurs ball now. Check out Derek White with a nice little alley-oop to DeJounte Murray, who is calling for it. He makes them pay. Spurs trail 39-37. We go to the third quarter now. Chris Middleton, a nice little behind-the-back no-look pass, and Giannis with the finish. Spurs fall to the Bucks 113 to 92. The Greek freak with 22. The Spurs led by Lonnie Walker. The fourth with 14. Next up for the Spurs, it'll be Brooklyn. This will be on Saturday at 3.30. Followed to wrap it up Tuesday against Indiana. Pro football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys have signed their first round draft pick, C.D. Lamb, to his first ever professional contract as the rookies arrived at their headquarters in Frisco this week. The deal is for four years, $14 million with a fifth year option, according to Clarence Hill, for the Fort Worth Star Telegram. It is all fully guaranteed. Lamb led Oklahoma in yards per catch after leaving the Sooners after three seasons. Now he's signed on the very day quarterbacks and injured players are due to camp today, but must go through the COVID 19 protocol, which is two negative tests before they can be. And workouts veterans report this coming Tuesday. When the University Interscholastic League announced its delay in the Texas high school football season, the most affected by the order were schools that play in the larger 6A and 5A districts, such as Judson or Brandeis or Lanier. They cannot start their seasons until September the 24th due to the soaring coronavirus cases. They cannot start their workouts until after Labor Day, September the 7th. But for schools in 4A to 1A, the UIL's rule, they can start on time, with games starting as early as August the 27th, with workouts beginning in less than two weeks on August the 3rd, such as the case for the Pope Pirates, who play in 3A Division two and are scheduled to open against the Lytle Pirates on August the 28th in Pote. But because of the TAPS ruling, may have to delay or replace San Antonio Christian that they are scheduled to host on September the 11th, since TAPS has already ruled their schools cannot kick off before September 28th. There will be some teams that could possibly be a disadvantage. You know, um, Somerset or some of the San Antonio schools that, that can't start till September. They may be playing teams in district that have been started in August. This is not just a local, you know, a local scenario. This is statewide. Yeah, this is going to be a crazy start. The reason for the different start days is that the UIL believes the increase in coronavirus cases affects more of the larger school districts in cities such as San Antonio, which has seen a dramatic increase in coronavirus cases over the last two weeks. So just shake it all up and see where it winds it's up. It's like puzzle pieces, <laughs> like trying yeah. to fit it all together. It really is late. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back. I tweet tweaked this rainfall graphic a little more in line with what I'm thinking right now and see the higher amounts closer to the coastline, lesser amounts closer to San Antonio. That would be Saturday into Sunday.